I am from Jacksonville, Florida. My parents got divorced when I was 16. I lost the relationship with my mother. My dad was going through a lot too. It became a bit hostile and uh, before I even graduated high school, I was homeless. So I was 17, senior year of high school and had no home. My life was survival. I ended up getting my first sales job and came into a successful amount of money where I was like, I need to get out of Florida. This is an option, I'm gonna risk it. I picked Chicago on a whim. I had no job, no friends, no family here. I just knew I needed to get out. I paid a company to pick out my apartment and the day after my 21st, I left. It only took me a couple weeks to get my first job. I got awards for climbing the corporate ladder so fast. I plan on giving it my all for the rest of the time here. I want to I be was here for... a young, successful woman. My life in Chicago was, at that time, within my control, or so I thought. I was in a relationship. In my mind at the time, it was all internal dialogue, but now I look back and I believe maybe God was trying to speak to me. And the moment I sat down, I got the, the message, you might be pregnant. I came home, took the test. I remember seeing that it was positive. And at the time I reasoned with myself, well, I'd rather lose this thing I don't know than lose my life that I love. Any girl, I would imagine, telling their boyfriend they're pregnant hopes that there's that excitement. And when I sat down and told him, he walked out of the room and came back and said, well, we have an appointment for August 28th to go ahead and just get the abortion. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. But everyone in my life agreed, get the abortion. You love your life, you're successful. How stupid would that be to have a kid right now? I wanted someone to talk to me about my options. I had only heard one option. And to be honest, that option of an abortion made the most sense. How I found the Caring Network was in that desperation of needing someone to talk to. When I walked in, I remember they came out and sat with me at a table and let me talk, let me cry. They never made me feel judged. It was not a conversation of what is right or wrong. They asked one question that I can still hear it in my head. If I told you God would provide everything and no one else mattered, would that help? Yes. Okay. Walking into their facility in those final moments of, of life or death for my daughter. And they changed everything for me. Again, by making me feel like I had a choice and I could do it on my own because, let me change that, I could do it with God. When she was born, I could hear her crying, and honestly, I just said, no. No, 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 I'm not ready. And they put the baby on her chest, and I remember catching her, and there's milliseconds. It's not just the seconds, it's the milliseconds where I open my eyes and I see my baby. For the first year of her life, I wrote her a letter every day for her to look back and see how much God carried us, how much God loves her, how much God loved me, how important it was for me to carry my faith. I wanted to know that. I could go back to Kaylin, who just found out she was pregnant and was terrified that this life that I built for myself was going to end, I would tell myself, good. <laughs> There's a better life, more than you could ever fathom. 
you're going to have so much more. Ministries like the Caring Network help women feel loved. And in the end, what more could change a life? Uh, I, I watched that several times in preparation, but I still knew that would be emotional to see. Caitlin's part of our church family, and it was a Christian friend who said, why don't you talk to somebody at Carry Network? That changed her life. So we pray for Carry Network, we support them, and we encourage you to uh, do the same. We have been uh, prayerfully pursuing a goal to raise $250,000 over Advent to help them build two new centers in our region. And uh, every dollar given up to 250 will go directly to Caring Network uh, through all of our Advent offerings. All of tonight's offering and then tomorrow's services will be going there as well. And for those of you watching online, you can give online as well. Any money that goes above and beyond $250,000, and it looks like we're going to exceed that goal, some will more, we will bless them and go to our other Serve the World partners. So you have been so generous in your prayers and in your financial contributions, and we just want to say thank you. And if God moves you in your heart to give, it'll, it'll help produce more stories like this one. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are the author of life. You've given us life, a gift we didn't deserve, and yet you brought us into this world and you love us and made us in your image. And not only that, Lord, you came into our world as a baby. And we celebrate that and reflect on it tonight. We ask you to speak to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's something deeply uh, reassuring about being here together to celebrate Christmas. In a world that continues to be uncertain and uh, full of division and fear and anxiety, we gather together as God's people and we are reminded. And it's not the kind of reminding that just by simple traditions. I mean, we've talked about traditions and nostalgia. You've got your traditions. How many of you are Christmas Eve people? You open Christmas on Christmas Eve. How many of you do it the prop proper biblical way and you open Christmas morning? <laughs> And I've told this story before, but when I was a kid, we always got the tradition of opening one present Christmas Eve, and my mom got to choose it. So by the time you're like 10, you figured out the game. I'm going to get new pajamas, we're going to take a picture. And so when you're 12 years old, just give me the jammies, I'm going to bed. Let's get to the good stuff, you know. I don't mean that kind of reminder with traditions. The other day I was sitting at home, and I was uh, hanging out reading, and my, my wife and daughter were, were making cookies, and I could smell it. It smelled like Christmas in the house, you know. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about something deeper than that. To know deep down in our soul that what Miss Becky said to the kids is true. God's with us. That Emmanuel's real. Not just something we say or sing about once a year when we gather together. But if we're honest, it doesn't always feel like God is with us. Sometimes he feels distant. And sometimes if we're honest, we're not with him. We're the ones who have drifted and who have moved and who have forgotten so we're not just here tonight to recapture a memory or get the warm fuzzies, but to remind ourselves of a profound spiritual truth. One of the ways Christians throughout history remind each other is when we sing. I, I remember talking to this guy who was new to church years ago. He said, I like the talk, but I could do without all the singing. <laughs> he had no idea. Why do you do all the singing? He would, I said, well, actually, biblically speaking, when God's people come together and sing God's praises, we're, we're declaring who he is because he's worthy of our praise. And in doing that, we are reminding ourselves and each other of those central truths. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish each other in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs together, giving thanks to God. So something happens when we sing songs Maybe you think, well, yeah, I know the Christmas songs. Something happens when you hear the Christmas songs that of our culture, you feel like Christmas again. That's not what I'm talking about. We've been doing that every week of this series in Advent, looking at the great hymns of our faith that are rich in theology and biblical imagery that we've been singing for generations. So tonight I want to look at the hymn we sang at the outset of this service, O Holy Night. How many of you know that hymn, that song? Right? How many artists have recorded a version of that? I was playing for my kids, Luciano Pavarotti, singing that in Italian, English, and French. They're like, Dad, turn it down. You know, so. Or Andrea Bocelli, or Michael Bublé, or you know, maybe, uh, or Mariah Carey. I wonder, does she know what she's singing when she sings that song beautifully? Or Celine Dion, or 
I don't know, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra or whatever, it's endless renditions of this song. I wonder sometimes, do the pop artists who record this beautifully, do they know what they're singing about? For that matter, do we? Do we know what it is we're saying and singing? Let's look at the first verse of this amazing hymn together. You heard Anton sing it a moment ago. O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It's the night of our dear Savior's birth. Listen to these next lines. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. Does the world seem weary? For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. By the way, this declaration is the only proper response to this statement of holiness. Oh, hear the angel voices. O oh, night divine. O oh, night when Christ was born. If you ponder those lyrics, they're profoundly biblical. Long lay the world and all the people in it in sin and error pining. We are muddling through in our own brokenness and despair, making a mess of our lives and uh, of, of the world in which we live. And we're pining, that is, longing, wishing for it to be different, trying in vain to make it better through elections and economies and educations and whatever else we can come up with, and it never quite works. We keep screwing things up, pining for something. Then the weary world and all of our brokenness and pining rejoices because something has happened. That's what the song is telling us. Well, this phrase, holiness, or holy, I want to talk about tonight. I don't know what you think about when you hear the word holy. When I, was, uh, when I, I became a Christian, I got serious about my faith when I was in high school, and I went to a Christian college, and I, I uh, grew up in my faith there. And I came back in the summers to my hometown. I grew up in Crystal Lake, just north of here. And I was with some of my buddies who knew me back when I wasn't, uh, well, the refined spiritual man you see before you today, let's just say. <laughs> I, I was rough around the edges, to say the least. I was a quintessential meathead when I was in high school. And they were like, well, we're going to go out and party, but we're not going to bring Frazier with us. He's too holy now. They said that. Like, kind of jabbing me a little bit. You're too holy to hang out with us anymore. What do they mean by that? Well, you're different. Something's happened to you. They were wrong. I wasn't holy then or now. But what do we mean? Well, let's ask this question. What makes this night Holy. Oh, holy night. Even the song we're going to sing at the end of the service, Silent Night, Holy Night. What, what, what's holy about it? It's not the date. We don't even know for certain. It was, certainly wasn't the 25th that Jesus was born of December. It's not a, what is it? Tradition? It's just a Christian way of saying this is a special time that we remember. No, we're singing about the presence of God. That's what makes the night holy. It's what makes anything holy, the presence of God. This might be a strange text to, ref to reference on Christmas, but some of you know the story of Exodus. Maybe you saw the movie, The Prince of Egypt, you know, Moses, his story. And he has this experience. You've probably seen it or heard about it if you haven't read it in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 3, he's in the desert outside of Sinai, in the, in the wilderness, outside of uh, in the Sinai wilderness, and he's attending flocks, and he sees a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. Imagine that for a minute. Imagine your Christmas tree at home. Uh, we have a Fraser fir tree, of course. Um, and it, it, it's on fire, but the needles aren't burning up. Nothing is being consumed, but it's on fire. There's a flame engulfing it, but it's not being consumed, which would be so strange because fire needs fuel. But this fire that Moses sees doesn't need any fuel. It's burning, but not consuming the bush. That, by the way, is an image of holiness. And what it means is this. God is the eternal flame, the self-existent one who's not dependent on anyone or anything. He doesn't need anyone or anything. We need him for our life and our breath. But he is not contingent or dependent on anything. He's totally different then. And he meets Moses there, and he speaks to him out of the bush. So when we say holiness, we're talking about two things. We're talking about absolute uniqueness, not like anything else. So for example, let's imagine on this side of the column, you put everything that's created. And on this side, you put everything that's not created. 
What goes over here? Everything. Everything. Right. Time, your personality, your friends, your family, this planet, all planets, stars, suns, solar system, moons, the universe, seas, plants, animals, ideas, education, institutions, civilizations, economies, everything you could possibly think of goes here. There's only one thing that goes here. God. So when we say holy, we mean unlike anything else. The psalmist says, of whom shall I compare you to? And the second thing we mean is absolute moral purity, perfection, no stain, no blemish. Absolutely perfect, absolutely, utterly unique. That God shows up in this bush burning and says to God, Moses, Moses. And by the way, when you, when the, in the Bible, when you see somebody say the name twice, it's a term of endearment. Like when Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to test you, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Or Martha, Martha, you're stressed and worried about all these things, but only one thing is needed. So God says to Moses, Moses, like a term of endearment. And do you know what he says next? Don't come any closer. Which is a little bit weird, isn't it? Like if your best friend said, Jeff, Jeff, don't come near me. Right? You'd be like, well, what? I, I, I want to be near you. How can there be a term of endearment and yet don't come near? The answer is the next sentence, God says. The place where you're standing is holy ground. What makes that ground holy? Was it the rocks? Was it the trees? Was it this special mountain? No, it's what we just said, the presence of God. I, I, the reason I bring up that Old Testament passage is for us to get in mind what's happening when we sing O Holy Night. What are we talking about when we talk about the incarnation and Emmanuel? The eternally self-existent one who's absolutely unlike anyone or anything else in the universe, who's absolutely morally perfect, that God takes on flesh? I can't help it when I'm standing at the door watching many of you walk in tonight seeing those of you bring in your little ones, babies in, in your car seats, your portable car seats and your bassinets and up here on stage, the Holy One of Almighty God became like that, weak, vulnerable, dependent. It's mind-blowing when we talk about that, the miracle of the Incarnation. So when God says to Moses, don't come nearer, he's saying, you cannot come to me because I'm holy and I would consume you, it would destroy you. But then we have a problem, don't we? How do we come near God? The truth is we can't draw near to God on our own terms. You don't get to decide how it works. God does. God is holy and God is love. These are hard to put together in our minds, if we're honest. How do, they, how do they fit in our concept of God? Sometimes we think God is love, and that makes sense. Yes, God is love. And we think God is love in, in the way that like, he doesn't care what you do, what you say, or what your past is, and that's sort of true, or how you behave. God just loves everybody, winks at sin, sweeps under the rug, and doesn't care. That's not love. That's not God. Or when we say God is holy, maybe you grew up in a tradition that talked about holiness like this. He's judgmental, he's angry, he's unpredictable, and if you step out of line, he's going to get you. That's not holiness, and that's not God. What, what we celebrate at Christmas is God showing us how holiness and love come together perfectly, beautifully in Jesus. And making it possible for us to know him not once a year when we remember, but every moment of our lives. Can you think of a time in recent history when we more needed to know that Emmanuel, God, is with us than now? To know it, not just tonight, tomorrow, this weekend, but certainly in the year to come and the rest of our lives, for all eternity, that God is with us. That's what the miracle of the incarnation shows us. So you cannot come near to God on your own terms because of his holiness. But he has come near to you in Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Again, not a Christmas passage, but you know, let me just tell you something. Christmas is one of the most exciting and difficult times to preach a message. Do you know why? Because most of you already assume you know what I'm gonna say. Blah, 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 baby in a manger, let's open presents, right? You think you know. But I want you to hear this in a fresh way. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, that's all of us, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, which meaning the presence of God. Remember what Moses said, don't come near. Now we have confidence to come close. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, look at this, draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. What was not possible before because of God's holiness and our sinfulness, Jesus makes possible. Let me put it to you simply. You cannot come near to God because God is holy. But God has come near to you because God is love. So you can draw near to him because of Jesus Christ. This is the message of Christmas, really. We always must have the, the, the manger with the cross in view. Otherwise, you know what happens? It's sweet baby Jesus that you put away in the box in a couple of weeks and you forget. That's why he came. We like to think of Christmas as a time of giving, of generosity. How many of you have had a few emails recently in your inbox asking you to donate to some, some charity or another? We just talked about one, right? It's the season, the end of the year, Christmas time. It's a time to be generous. And that's a good thing. Even the scroogiest and the grinchiest of us are somewhat generous at Christmas time, aren't we? We give a little, we feel good about ourselves. But the message of Christmas is not first that it's better to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than receive, that's biblical. But the message of Christmas is this. Fundamentally, you are receivers before you're givers. The message of Christmas is you must receive that gift you didn't even know you needed and you may not even have asked for. The gift of grace that God gives in his son Jesus by coming into this world, the holy one, the unapproachable one, the one unlike anything else in all creation has come near to you so that you might receive his forgiveness and mercy and love. Over 50 times in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as a gift. Paul says he's the indescribable gift. I just wanna ask you a question. When's the last time, maybe you've been in a rush the last few days, I know I have. When's the last time you sat and just pondered and were awestruck and overcome by the sheer magnitude of this gift that God gave you himself? Have you ever stopped and just been overwhelmed with how far God was willing to go for you? To leave heaven, to set aside all of his privileges and rights as the God of the universe and enter into our world to take on flesh? Why? So that we could draw near to him. So that he could be with us and we could be with him. I'm gonna give you a moment before we have our traditional closing of singing Silent Night together. Right now, where you're seated, to do that, to ponder, to reflect, to think about, when we sing holy night, the holy God of the universe loved us enough that he would enter into a world. Think about what that meant, what he had to go through to be with you. Just bow your head for a minute. And in your own way, pray and reflect on the depth of God's love for you this Christmas. God, we are often so busy and fast and hurried and distracted that we lose sight and we don't slow down enough to reflect on just who you are. We would be hopelessly lost, stumbling around in sin and error pining if it were not for you. And we are part of a weary world and tonight we do rejoice that the new and glorious morn has broken with you coming into our world. 
I pray that for each one of us, Lord, we would receive, maybe for the first time, maybe again for the 200th or countless time, the deep, gracious reminder that you are Emmanuel, that you're with us. May we be with you this Christmas, this new year, and every moment of every day that you give us breath. Amen.